Welcome to the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast, bringing you open and honest conversations about resources in Tuscarawas County. Now here's your host, Jody Salvo. Hi, this is Jody Salvo. Welcome to another edition of the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast. Today I have two great guests. Um, I have Ro- Rachel Rodocker with uh, Stark Tusk Wayne Recycling. Actually, do you have another name you all call yourself? We call ourselves the Recycling District, but it's Joint Solid Waste Management District is the, the long Very name. Good. Yeah, <laughs> I never get all that right. So. Yeah, it's a long one. Rachel, and we have Sheriff Orvis Campbell from Tuscarawas Yay. County. Thank you. Good Yay. to be here. Wonderful. Listen, today we're speaking about um, the safe storage disposal of prescription medications and the reason that we bring you in right now is it's right before the holidays and we always have increased traffic well maybe not in 2020 we might not have as much increased traffic around the holidays huh i think we will i think we're still going to have people just are not going to give up that family time and hopefully they'll be cautious about it but when you've lost so much this year i think the idea of uh you know not having a thanksgiving together or a christmas together is probably just not I, I don't think it's terribly realistic. I do know some people. I spoke to a woman yesterday on the phone, said she's canceled all her out-of-state kids uh, from coming. Wow. But I think in general, they'll, they'll still be gatherings. Yeah, so. sounds good. So what we're doing is when holiday season comes, we typically have more traffic into our homes. And we absolutely know that when people come in the homes, um, prescription medications actually can be a hot commodity. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Orvis, what do you... So, I, I mean, I think that people have to understand that, especially with the the more dangerous narcotics, the pain medications, it's just, you know, it's like uh, it's like sweets for me. You know, the people that, that have a problem with these types of things, I think it's just too much to resist. And uh, fortunately, I, I never developed a problem with this type of thing, but... You know, I have trouble leaving the pie or cake alone. So when you <laughs> get people you? together on the holidays and, and this is a, a temptation for them, I think it's, it's going to be a real problem. Now, this year, <laughs> I mean, I don't think we'll ever see another year like this year, I hope. But, Let's I mean, hope not. <laughs> depression is way up. Um, people have done without. I mean, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, really bad things this year. So I'm afraid that the temptation may even be more than it normally is. So... I think people really need to pay attention this year and and watch this. You wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to be the reason that somebody got a hold of something and and had something bad happen. You know, we've had multiple prescription overdoses that we've responded to here in recent weeks, and it's just something that you 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 have to treat this like a loaded gun. Yeah. Um. You know, and and uh, these uh, prescription pills are just as dangerous. Sure. So, so uh, Orvis, I'm just going to bring out. I'm on the. Um, prescription drug committee with the anti-drug coalition which rachel is as well and normally we have someone from the healthcare um, community or jeff nidig will be here that kind of connects the dots but in your brief intro here you really kind of tied some things together prescription medications definitely have a potential for abuse um, and we know a lot of research that Initiation can start in a home medicine cabinet, in homes, grandparents have medications, parents can have them, where whether it's curiosity or trying to self-medicate or not taking medications as prescribed can lead us down a path. Yeah, and, the, and the tricky part with these drugs in particular, if I might, Jody, is that they often start with a legitimate reason. It's people getting them prescribed by a doctor, but then maybe you have some left over that you don't use once yeah. you've gone through them or you know, maybe someone who's not intended to take them takes them. Another piece of the puzzle is um, I have young children at home, so it's not so much curiosity about, oh, I want to try to take this and, you know, get a high, but they could accidentally Accidentally. take it. And so that's a problem if you have kids around that aren't normally around during the holidays too. Yeah. So Rachel, as you talk about that, you have kids at home, we have this box. Tell us about this because honestly, your organization was one that was instrumental yes. in us receiving these. Uh, yes, we actually, um, I'm on the prescription drug committee, as Jody said, but I work at the recycling district. And some people might think, well, what's that have to do? What's recycling have to do with drugs? But we actually help with the safe and sanitary disposal of any hazardous waste. And we that includes the prescription drugs. So uh, the Prescription Drug Committee, we applied for a grant through my organization to get, it was several pieces. It was magnets, um, I think some flyers, and other printed materials, and then in 
in part these boxes, these are lock boxes, they are not safes. If someone was desperate to get into them, they could, but it is definitely a good deterrent as they have a, a code on the top. So if someone wanted to lock them and they thought they might have youth in and out of the house that would be curious and might otherwise get into them, this would probably protect the drugs. Nice. Very good. Um, what were you going to say, Orvis? Well, all I was going to say is, you know, I think these boxes, um, they do a lot more than just keep keep the, the uh, pills uh, out of the hands of little ones, too. I think for, for my house, I think that times have changed. You know, when I was little, um, even aspirin, things like that, we didn't have... F- immediate access to that. It wasn't something you took daily for right. every minor headache. And I think that over time, um, because doctors do prescribe pills, people have developed a, uh, a much more lackadaisical attitude towards prescription pills and not realizing their danger. I think that even having these things around and keeping your stuff locked up mm-hmm. is good educationally. I think it's a constant reminder that what's in here is dangerous. And I think, sub, you know, subliminally, quietly in the back of their head, kids will pick up on that, you know, and in my kitchen, ours is actually mounted. It's a it's a it's a metal and glass box mounted on a wall. And uh, Griff, you know, I have a seven year old. Griffin doesn't have access to the key, and uh, he's got a daily medication he has to take. But he, you know, it's locked up, and we want him to see that we look at that as something dangerous. So what he equivocates it to is, uh, I come home every day and I take my gun out of my holster, and it immediately goes in the safe. And he knows the pills are locked up well. And I think. For kids, it simply tells them they're both dangerous. And that's I think awesome. that's important. So That is great. So you have a permanent lockbox for the I have the a medication. permanent lockbox on the wall in the kitchen. It's um, it's it was, it's designed to be that. Um, I, I wasn't sure that uh, my wife loved the idea of me mounting it to the kitchen wall <laughs> because it's it does not uh, it's not pretty. <laughs> it's uh, but it is something that we felt was necessary while he was little. First of all, it's kind of high up. He he would have to drag a chair over to even get to it. But but he's but, a little boy, so. Oh, and he could drag a chair around. <laughs> Believe me, we've caught him on top of uh, all kinds of things. So, but I just think that that's an important thing. Is you know treat this like they're the danger that they are. You know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, over the counter medications can be dangerous. You know, you need to know. I have a good yeah. friend that has. Um, a, a medical condition. It's not a condition that causes him any problem, but it's a condition you could recognize by looking at him slightly. And and he took an over-the-counter cold medication, and it really affected him. People thought he was starting to have a mental breakdown, that he was having all kinds of issues. This is a great guy, an intelligent guy, a professional guy, and uh, he's pacing the house all night. You know, he's making some uh, comments to people that don't make any sense, and they finally is family intercedes and they take him to the doctor and and it was him just self-medicating going and picking something off the counter and didn't realize it was going to react with his his condition and and his condition is not one that requires anything it's just something he was born with it's it's there and i think that people just need to be careful about what they put in their mouth i mean i think you need to do your research yeah and especially because i think uh, we've talked about this in prior Mm -hmm. podcasts but the focus has been shifted off of learning other pain management techniques and directly onto people want to take a pill and make the problem go away instead of you know maybe try some other things and learn how to live with a pain because some chronic conditions you're going to have that pain and if you're addicted to a a painkiller, but then your prescription runs out, what are you going to turn to? (laughs) And one of the things that you kind of touched on, um, the anti-drug coalition, all our efforts are based off data. So what is driving our efforts? And it's interesting because we've looked at prescription drug misuse among our young people, and we really haven't seen that rise up in our data, but yet we have a pretty significant addiction, overdose rate with prescription medications, heroin, fentanyl, kind of all those opioids. Um, But where we were kind of learning, you know, we've done some focus groups with school nurses, is it's not that our kids have access to the prescription medications per se, but they do not safely properly take over-the-counter medications. And I think it's just okay, we need to read the label. We need to understand that they are medications, that they can have different effects with our bodies. And I think the lockbox is a way to kind of help us go, okay, how do we take these? What's the proper way? We need to manage these safely and and kind of relearn how to respect medications, whether it's over-the-counter or prescription. Yeah. Well, I think that... um you know, marketing. Oh my gosh. It's, 
you know, if you want to lose weight, there's a pill you take. Yeah. And t- everybody knows it's moderate eating yeah. and exercise. <laughs> it's, I mean, you can try to get around it all you want, yeah. but the f- when you, when you meet somebody that's fit in a gym, I could probably tell you they're eating pretty well and they're exercising. And, uh, so that, that pill isn't that gonna pill work. Is, yeah. is not going to do Didn't what you want them. it to do. And there's a pill for just about everything anymore. And I really just think that all of that is because it's marketed right in front of us on TV. They're not hiding it. I mean, if, if the only place you could get pills wasn't from a pharmacy and you had to go into a dark alley, we probably wouldn't have to talk (laughs) about this problem, but it looks like it's, you know, something that's widely accepted. And, and of course, if you need the pill and your doctors sure, yes. monitor, it's it's the right thing for you. I mean, the pills save a lot of people yeah. too. I mean, there's, you know, I know, uh, uh, you know, one gentleman who's a, been on blood pressure pills since he was 17 and he was a long distance runner and he, and he played sports in college and it's just, he needs that blood pressure pill, but other people just are always looking sure. for that quick fix. So I, I, I think if people could see what we saw, they would pay a closer attention to it. I agree yeah. with you. We don't come up with as many teens abusing these. Um, What we have come in contact, though, with is they have a, your pills have a great financial value on the street. So we have had them uh, sell and trade them for other things, whether it was alcohol or a different type of drug. Um, We do see more of a a problem with middle-aged people um, who are taking the pills for different reasons. I mean, so uh, a lot of our overdoses that way. These boxes, though, I think I'd be safe. These are... These are definitely designed for little kids. Yeah. I mean, if, if you and I wanted to get in these, uh, <laughs> we, we, we'd be able to get in there pretty quickly. But it's to it's designed to prevent that accidental mm-hmm. kid who just stumbles across a pill bottle and, and uh, you know, keep it away from them. So I think that's those are all important. Yeah. Hey, Oris, go ahead and pa- pass that over to me, or Sheriff. Um, I want to show you the box real quick. Um so with these boxes, we just started disseminating them. They're at um, Job and Family, Family Services, Community Mental Health, and Ohio Guidestone. Um, and the committee's just trying to figure out who these boxes go to, but I kind of wanted to show how they work. Um, and mainly for someone out there that maybe if you have a young person. Oh, I'm going to look over at Josh. Hi, Josh. <laughs> If you have a young person that maybe is on a stimulant medication, like an ADHD medication, this might be a great box for you. Or if you're an adult and someone in your home is on a long-term opioid, antidepressant, anti-anxiety, these might be a great option for you. So what comes in the kit is, first of all, the little lock mechanism, which can you can put your medications in here and lock it. But this also fits on a regular prescription bottle. So if you just have one medication, one person has an ADHD medication, you can put that in and you can see there's a combination on it. Um, When you open the box up, though, if you receive a box, you'll receive a brochure from the Anti-Drug Coalition on prescription uh, medications. And it's for parents. How do you talk to your kids about these? How do you have effective conversations? Where are the resources? Um, It also has a magnet on where the permanent drop-off boxes are in the county. And why don't you talk to us about the permanent drop-off boxes, Orvis? So, for example, the permanent drop boxes uh, are different law enforcement agencies within the county. We have one at the Tuscross County Sheriff's Office. You do not need an appointment. You could come into our front lobby at 3 in the morning. It's a steel box. There's actually a photo of it here on the, on the front of this magnet. It's bolted to the floor in the wall, and uh, you just... Open it up like a one-way mailbox and drop your pills in, and you don't have to speak to anyone. You literally can be in and out. Pull up to the curb, walk in, drop them, and get rid of them. No questions asked. Do you guys um, get a lot of medications in we there? We do. So this box probably is full twice a week, at least, at least, uh, that wow. it's emptied. It's completely full. And uh, uh, they also and it's ha- the size of a mailbox. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a large steel um mailbox size box you know and and it it fills up uh there's also one at the denison police department the new philadelphia police department the newcomerstown police department the strasburg police department and sugar creek police department have these as well so those are just trying to be you know uh something that uh you can get to easily if in your community and drop them off if you don't want to leave them around your house of course we have some with uh our partnership with the uh anti-drug coalition and with the uh, recycling district we have uh take back days as well Mm -hmm. we just experienced one here in october 
which is one of the two national prescription drug take back days. Uh, but the month before that, we did one in Wilkshire Hills at the Giant Eagle, yep. and we did one um, at the uh, uh, grocery store down in New Commerstown as well, where it was just a drive through style. And we're going to try to, you know, really start doing more of this because we believe the more we keep this in the face of people to, to think about these as dangerous, that, that that's a good educational piece. But a lot of people are concerned coming in our office. Is there paperwork involved? There's nothing. You literally <laughs> park at the curb, walk in, drop it in a box, and get back out. The only reason it's in our lobby is because we want to keep it secure. Mm -hmm. One of the regulations and requirements uh, needed is that it's under camera, that it's in a secure location. So a couple of these part-time police departments, um, you know, that are, don't have somebody in there full-time, you have to call them first. Okay. Uh, but like New Philadelphia and uh, the sheriff's office, for certain, you just walk in and drop it off and walk back out. Nobody will ask you anything. Nice. Or uh, Now, how are they disposed of? That's actually um, through a partnership with us. We send them up to um, a hazardous waste incinerator called Ross Environmental, which is up near Cleveland, I believe. And they are a one of only, I think, two or maybe three now in the state that okay. is legally allowed to incinerate them. And the reason incineration is preferred and why we kind of step into this picture is because they don't recommend, uh, the EPA does not recommend flushing the medications and they become part of the water table. They say you can throw them away in a landfill, but you still have that risk that it might leach out into the surrounding water okay. table. So incineration is the preferred method, and in addition, it makes it unretrievable. Once they're burned up, if someone actually buried these, you wouldn't believe, I bet you could speak to it. People go digging in the trash for different things, needles, pills, you know, yeah. credit card statements, anything you can think of, people might dig in the trash for it. So once they're incinerated, people cannot take them after that. They're not retrievable. Very yeah, good. so we... Uh, we have one deputy uh, who's assigned to um, work in what we call the environmental deputy position um, that is paid for by the uh, recycling district, solid joint waste management district. And that deputy will go around all the police departments, collect theirs, bring them back. They're secured in an evidence room. And then uh, he and the evidence technician, when they get enough, will schedule uh, an incineration I'll put them in a van and drive them up to okay. Cleveland and have them disposed of. And that's paid for uh, by the district, which we, we, we greatly appreciate because it's an expensive process. But mm -hmm. I think that everybody involved feels it's just that important to make sure that they're disposed of properly. And, and you know, I, nobody truly knows what the risk is to the water table, but I would hate to find out later that, yes. uh, yeah. that it was a horrible risk and there was all these side effects when we could do it correctly. So that's how it's done. Very good. Um, Orvis. Uh, sheriff, I should call you sheriff. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Give Orvis you the is good. Respect that you yeah. deserve. Um, I've heard you speak about prevention before because I clearly, probably a lot of the work you and your your officers do is around substance use and addiction, right? Yeah. Do you see this as a key for prevention? And I, I, I think that, um, I think that education. So when I talk about education, most people probably think right away to like a dare type program, but I think it's just constant reminder of the danger is the greatest education. You know, our jails always full and it's always full because of addiction. It's the one thing when a jail was built in 92, it was built for 88 males and 12 females. And we would have two or three females okay. in, um, our jail counts down a little bit now because of COVID, but prior to COVID we would have 40 females every day. Okay. We don't even have room for that. You know, it okay. was built for 12 females and addiction was the reason. Um, it, it touches all the families. I think that, you know, uh, prescription pills start out um, either with easy access or with legitimate use. Mm -hmm. And it is, they are incredibly um, they powerful. Yep. Uh, you know, I had a knee surgery and I remember coming out of this knee surgery thinking, wow, I'm in no pain. I felt like I could have went jogging. And then a few hours later, it was the most <laughs> horrific thing ever. And I realized the effect uh, that the medication had on me. And, and uh, that has a euphoric effect as well. It's dangerous. It's one of those things you just need to avoid. And then, but once you're addicted, um, you know, and then you switch to a different type of drug, a more illegal drug, uh, you know, heroin, methamphetamine, then uh, desperation really kicks sure. in, you know. So it is truly probably the most important thing we do. You know, parents, I think um, they, they come from two different perspectives. We've got one set of parents who maybe experimented with some drugs 
25 years ago, and they feel hypocritical preaching to their mm-hmm. kids, and they shouldn't. Yeah. First of all, drugs were completely different back yeah. then. Yeah. They weren't nearly as effective or powerful. Um, and, and we didn't know what we know now either. Exactly. Know? And secondly, you're not a hypocrite if you've changed your mind. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you've done things and realized they were mistakes or bad for you, it's not a hypocrite to constantly and be enforcing that it was a mistake and to, to, to teach your kids to be, uh, to stay away from it. The other side is, um, the people that, uh, who have stayed away from drugs their whole life and who hear about these horror stories and then preach about it, but maybe are so paranoid about it that other people don't take their advice seriously okay. because they just mm. don't believe it can be that bad. Mm. It can be that bad. Yeah. Um, the stories are really bad. If you saw somebody detox in a jail, if you've seen it worked a case where somebody tried to sell their child yeah. um, for the next fix, it's bad. And the only way to, to, to perfectly rid it from our community is to abstain from it. Just, mm-hmm. and, you know. Um, and share, if you probably can share with people that people that have committed these horrific acts are probably not bad people. That's probably the addiction in them at the time do you see them after the fact after the medications out of their system in in fact and then we have our our next biggest problem in the jail which is depression Mm -hmm. um suicide attempts uh the people that make the choices that become addictive and then do the things that they do to uh maintain their habit they're not proud of what they do um i can't speak for everybody i'm gonna just speak in generalizations they're they're very depressed and when they are finally sober when they've gone through um, detox and they've, you know, been vomiting and shaking and then they get through all that. Now they're looking back at the family members they betrayed, the kids that they've abandoned, uh, or not been there for, or the, you know, and it's a very hard thing for them to live sure. with. And, uh, it's, it's tough to turn that stuff around. It can be done. Yeah. And I, I, I'm very fortunate to know people that have turned it all around, who've gotten back in their kids' lives, who've been a great father yeah. and, and, uh, you know, I've seen marriages uh, destroyed because of it. But then uh, there's one specific case I know where they're back together and it's just a great family and yeah. they're all consider themselves in recovery together. So there is hope, but it's an uphill battle. Mm-hmm. And you never have to go up that hill if you just take this sure. stuff seriously. Yeah. And that's part of the importance uh, in our prescription drug committee is that we focus on three different tenets. There's safe use of the drugs because, some, like you said, sure. sometimes it's legitimate, sure. it's unavoidable. They're going to be drugs, over-the-counter drugs, everything we've discussed up to this point. And then there's safe storage of the drugs. If you're going to have a drug that you actually have to take daily or something, you want to make sure it's stored properly so that it's not accidentally ingested or purposely taken and then misused. And then the safe disposal. Uh, In the case where you do have a surgery, you needed pain medicine legitimately in the beginning, but then maybe you have, you know, 10 pills left. Sure. That's the kind of stuff that's so strong that you really want to get it out of the house so that it doesn't become a problem. It's not... It, yeah. It's not going to fall some into the wrong hands. Yeah, neat. Yeah, I agree. It's. Uh, I think it's just important to have a general attitude of caution towards anything uh, like this. So yes. neat. I love your perspective. You you really can be the voice of prevention, education, the importance of making healthy decisions. Those conversations with parents with mm-hmm. with our young people. Because our young people, they care what adults think. You know, they care what their parents think. We have research that says when parents have those effective conversations, kids are 50% less likely to engage in substance use. So it's just knowing that we can have open conversations with our kids. We need to have them often. Um, We need to be really kind of helping them understand how easily addiction can happen because I do think you don't think this could ever happen to me and uh, I think it's nice to hear yeah this this can happen to anybody Um, great families have it hit them Um, you know it's uh, uh, it's a girl going on a date when she's uh, 17 or 18 and a boy you know I'm being stereotypical here, but a boy talks her into trying one thing and it happens to be heroin. It's 98% pure and they're legally addicted the next day. And it's a drug like no other. I mean, when you're addicted to heroin, if you can he recall a story of somebody who drank too much and then got sick mm-hmm. and they, they, they say they're never going to do it again. They <laughs> promise I'm never going to drink like that again. Well, it's just the exact opposite with heroin. You know, you become a heroin addict, you know, you are sick 
every minute until you get your next fix. Mm-hmm. And on the street, they call it being dope sick. It's, mm-hmm. And you're physically ill. You're shaking. You're vomiting. You're cold. You're sweating until you get your next fix. And that's all you can think about. I mean, think about the worst flu you've ever had. Yeah. And if somebody said, if you take this, it'll all go away. Uh, And that's what happens. And it's a, it's a dangerous thing. And I think, I think our, our treatment and substance abuse counselors are doing the best work they've ever done. It doesn't appear like it because they're also up against the toughest drugs Uh, they've ever been up against. And it's, it's very frightening right now to know that, um, you know, if you've got a young person that gets addicted, that there's uh, all the services are full. I mean, we're, uh, there are places to call, but I mean, it's, it's tough. It's tough to get them in. Um, and you've got to have a, a big support network. That's the other key part for the ones that we say that we see, I'm sorry, in our system that do make it. It's because they have a big support system. Yeah. It's somebody mm-hmm. going to be there. I mean, I promise you, I see, you know, uh, no more, nobody in the world's more sincere than the addicts we see in jail who swear to us that they are never going to touch it again mm-hmm. when they get out, but they've got no support. They've sure. got no real plan yeah. and uh, they get out and they're right back in it over and over. And it's the most depressing thing. So, so two topics that you hit it there. One is when you spoke about heroin, there's a direct tie to heroin and our prescription, med- prescription medication. So, and you had mentioned the young girl with the young guy, um, that heroin's probably looking like a pill that first time he gave it to her, correct? Because right. I think a lot so, of times people think you're shooting yeah. up or when they see heroin. But when people are first trying, they might not even realize what they're trying, correct? Right. And I can tell you that uh, there's an awful lot of people that if they've never taken intravenous drugs with a needle, that's not how their heroin starts either. I mean, uh, you can sniff heroin yeah. just like you did older traditional cocaine and, and – uh, I can tell you that um, that is typically how they start if they've never used needles before, if they were afraid of needles. But then once the dependency is there, the yeah. needle is no longer even a concern. Yeah. I mean, if they had to put it in their body, they'd take a knife and slice their arm open to get it in that way. Once they're That's addicted, true. they no longer have any concern or fear of the needle. It just becomes something that um, is a method of getting it in, yeah. and they, they could care less what that method is. And they're not bad people, but it's a desperation like most people can't understand. Sure. And a lot of times when people first try, they might not even know what drugs in there at this point. Right. Well, that's the truth uh, as well. I mean, uh, uh, you know, fentanyl, carfentanyl, these things are causing most of the deaths and the overdoses. Um, uh, in fact, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, we had a major switch from a lot of heroin to methamphetamine solely because even the addicts were terrified about what they were taking. They could no longer be sure what was in there. And this fentanyl and carfentanil is so powerful that we had an explosion of uh, overdose deaths mm-hmm. and, and it, it frightened those addicts. So there became a lot of methamphetamine use. Um, there is more heroin use again and uh, things like that. But still, when you talk to the coroner's office or somebody like that, those deaths typically come down to fentanyl and carfentanil. So uh, you never know what's in there. Um, yeah. If they mix a little bit of carfentanil in with it, they can make a lot more product. They get you higher for a lot more money. It's mm-hmm. it's about making more money yeah. off of their their products. So it's a greedy business. Um, the other thing that's sad is that if you are a heroin addict uh, or a methamphetamine addict, you're probably with almost a hundred percent certainty you're also a dealer. You're not the type of dealer who wants to make money. But uh, they're, they're mm-hmm. so they're so uh, they're so commanded by this addiction that they have to have it every so many hours or so long. So if I have a little extra, I give it to you because you're going to do the same for me. And they look at themselves as taking care of each other as they're sick because they're dope sick. So it's really got a it's got a unique uh, uh, presence over the people that are there. And and I can. You know, I'm to the age now where I've I've had uh, I've you know I've I've been around uh, 30 years for the county, and uh, we've got three grown kids that made it so far and have had none of these problems. But we have one little one, and I'm just as terrified, mm-hmm. probably more because I get to see the really ugly parts of it. But it's a it's a scary thing, and and uh, I will tell you that it's not an easy fight. So if you stay away from them, that's the best way you, you can avoid it. I know we're probably running close to time at this point. But the other thing that you touched on that I think we really need to share out is that we have great 
treatment agencies mm. here in the community. We do have resources. Like you said, they're full, they're busy, um, they're doing great work. Um, but the agencies are here. You can call the Adams Board to find out um, what might be some good options for you here in the community. Um, but also to hear that treatment is effective and there is hope. And I think we just did that Project Hope here in the county just to say, look, you know, it might seem like a really rough struggle and, you know, there might be people dealing with lack of support, but there's also a whole community here that wants people to be well and healthy and supported. We have faith-based recovery. We have recovery groups, support groups, treatment agencies. Um, so there is hope. And, and there's your silver lining. Mm -hmm. So 10 years ago, I think um, the people that uh, there was so much shame uh, involved with being addicted. And I think people now have learned that really it's an illness yes. and that there's a lot less shame and people who may sure. have looked down upon you before, I think you'll be surprised that they'll, they'll be happy to step forward and help and get you, uh, to someone. And that's absolutely right. So, I mean, there's always something good that comes yeah. out of the bad and that's it. I think the community is pulled together. I mean, there's been marches, there's been, you know, yeah. displays, there's all kinds of events going on now to encourage people to get into treatment. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So. If you think about it, like addiction just being another form of a, a different mental health sure. disorder, then it really does help, I think, destigmatize it. It helps yep. people realize that maybe some people are predisposed to have, I call it the addictive personality. Yeah. Um, some people probably aren't as prone to it, but as you can see, you can easily get started down that path, even if it's a legitimate start, like yeah. prescription drug. So. I agree. Rachel, I want to thank you and the recycling district. Just sure. Honestly, you guys bring a lot of um, energy, resources. Um, you bring a lot of passion and heart to this effort. Um, Sheriff, you just do an amazing job. And I think you lead our county extremely well. And it's so great to hear from your perspective, you know, what can we do to have a healthier community? And just an understanding of addiction and, and really caring about people that might be struggling out there and that we have resources. If anyone out there... Do you, if you have medications of a potential abuse in your home, um, please feel free to reach out to the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition. We can get a box out to you if that would be something else. Oh, and I just look inside. The terror bags. Yeah, yeah we have a gonna, bag in there. Yeah, I was going to mention that no matter uh, what your circumstance, there's some way we can help you. Uh, even if maybe you're leery to go into a law enforcement office, you don't want to go to the drop box, we have deterra bags. They're, the EPA recommends incineration, but the deterra bags are kind of another way we can help people if there's some kind of obstacle to getting to law enforcement. Yeah. The take back days, that's another one. Usually they're at hospitals or grocery store so you don't have to enter sure. so we really try to remove any of those obstacles so that any person in the county who needs help with safe storage or safe disposal has an option thank you for that reminder. you're welcome i meant to say that earlier good job yeah i kind of i was even saying we don't have a deter bags but yeah. they're right in your home lock boxes so it's for a safe um and easy home removal of medications so just a reminder holidays are coming up you'll probably have increased traffic in your home it is important to lock up to safely store or dispose of unwanted unused medications um, just to eliminate any potential for abuse um, or misuse. So thank you for uh, listening today and we'll catch you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast. Please follow us on Facebook and visit our website at adctusk.org.